hello and welcome to AML Gray Matters. Today is Wednesday, 16th February, 2022. I'm your host, Kimberly Smith, co-founder of Silo Compliance System and a former compliance officer and MLRO. I want to welcome our live audience. It's exciting to see our audience from all over the world. And I especially welcome the diehards joining us in their late evenings and all of the Silo Compliance System users too. It's good to see so many of you staying on top of risk management issues. Today, we have Corinna Venturi joining us from the UK. I've known Corinna for 10 years now and value her decades of experience in anti-money laundering compliance. But no matter how many years of experience one has in compliance, taking an hour to think, taking an hour to think about your basic client onboarding and risk assessment procedures is crucial to staying up to date and relevant. With so many events going on in the world, our risk assessment procedures must stay current to protect your business. And Corinna and I aim to get you thinking about your practices and find ways to improve them. Corinna, thank you for joining us today. Would you like to give us a little brief um, about your, your experience in AML? Hi, Kimberly. Great to uh, join you today. Very excited about our chat. Um, yeah. Yes, uh, as you've said, decades of experience. Um, <laughs> dear, should, probably shouldn't say that. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, it's such an ever-evolving uh, thing, risk assessment. Um, and so it's good for us to go through it. Um, I've seen lots of, uh, as, as you have too, seen lots of different um, ways that uh, people do it um, incorrectly and correctly. Uh, so we, uh, we can talk about that. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before we do begin, I do want to remind our audience that this webinar is not legal advice. Uh, we will be taking questions from the live audience at the end, and we encourage your questions. And today's webinar, we anticipate, will last approximately one hour. Uh, for those of you who need certificates, they will be auto-generated and sent to you via email approximately one hour after the end of the broadcast. Uh, there are no handouts today, but slides and recording of this broadcast will be sent out in a few days. Usually by Friday, we get that email out to you. Um, I do have a few polling questions for our live audience. Uh, your responses help us know who is listening in and, and helps us address some of the issues you may be facing. So Tom, um, would you mind launching the first poll question? So yeah, I think the first one is, uh, um, how do you feel about your client risk procedures? Again, if you just take a, uh, a few moments just to, to answer that. And a big thanks to Tom Gardner, who is working behind the scenes, launching these, these uh, polling questions. So this question was, uh, I'm asking you, you know, are your current uh, risk assessment procedures easy to understand and complete? Uh, Tom, do you want to go ahead and close that? So we have 47% saying yes, they're easy and under, uh, to understand and complete. 47% are saying somewhat. Um, thankfully, we, we only have a couple of people who are saying that no, that they're way too complex and that can happen. And so uh, just a few percent are saying that it's not applicable to them. So go ahead and launch the next question, Tom. And this is asking you to kind of give us an idea what your last audit uh, of your AML compliance procedures kind of revealed. Um, I'm great, so this is looking good. So it looks like a pretty good majority are saying that your last AML audience uh, audit did say that you did require some improvements. Good. All right. You want to go ahead and close that one, Tom? Okay. So 58% said it did require, sorry, I can't read the whole thing, but it looks like it's saying that uh, it did require some improvements. 15%, um, no changes were needed. 21% uh, don't know. You're probably because you're not involved in, in audits. And 7% said you had some major deficiencies. So hopefully we can help uh, those of you who have some major deficiencies. And one last polling question before we get started. Uh, and this is going to help us assess what you are wanting out of your risk assessment procedures. Um, trying to find out if you're looking for simpler ways, uh, reduce the time, if you're looking for some more automation. 
as, as technology does um, mature, there are some automation um, tools out there. We won't be ta talking about those today, but maybe we can talk about those in a, in a future webinar. Okay, fantastic. Go ahead and close that, Paul, if you don't mind. So a uh, majority of you, it seems to, uh, and this was a, you could select multiple ones. So 68% are saying you want simpler risk assessment processes. I hate to disappoint you. Um, I think what's one thing Corinne and I are going to be talking about is how complex it really is. 64% uh, to reduce the time. And of course, 55% are saying you want more automation. So, um, and some of you are wanting to reduce your compliance cost and overhead. Yeah, I think that's uh, pretty common, really. And 8% looking for a bigger budget. So uh, as one of my, my phrases is pick your battle. So um, yeah, um, thank you very much for that. So go ahead and hide, hide that question. Fantastic. So to kick off our discussion, uh, I wanted Corinna to give us some ideas and, and Corinna and I both will, will you know, give our input. So some of the things that we've seen in our 10 plus years of experience in AML and working with different companies, it's both small and large. So, Corinna, let me know, what's the worst client risk assessment practice that you've come across? Um, I love this question. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, when we were chatting amongst ourselves, that uh, the worst one that I've ever seen actually was really recently. Um, and the client, uh, I was helping them obviously update their procedures, thankfully, um, and the client, their compliance person was just looking at a file and putting uh, what risk level they thought it was on the file, just writing it. No, no idea, no recording of how they came to that conclusion. Um, okay. It was just placed on the file and that was that. Um, now, the reality was is that they were, you know, assessing it in accordance with their procedures, which were not, you know, too bad apart from that obvious um, glaring uh, missing piece of information um, but they just weren't recording it properly that was that was the major problem um, but it looked terrible so anyone coming in to do an audit or any sort of assurance review or anything like that you know that's all they see you know they don't know what's going on because they haven't basically recorded the information properly right that's a pretty simplified process though <laughs> very simplified that's high risk <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> i will not tell you how i know that but it is <laughs> yeah. whereas it, well, i saw the opposite my worst was it had over 20 steps in the process i mean it was just pages and pages and pages of forms and uh and so i thought they had over complicated uh so it's interesting that, that yours is one one way and my my worst you know um you know assessment practice that i've seen is yeah it's too complex that's interesting um, that's really interesting yeah yeah. That, yeah you can totally do that and just spend so much time and then you're kind of losing you know the the real reasons for for doing it you know that can be you know you can get absolutely mired in in paperwork um, yeah, and lose absolutely. the re the real reason as to why you're doing it right right um and of course i guess you know that leads to the second question if there was one thing that they could do to improve it what would you have them do immediately and i guess your answer to that <laughs> yeah. is yeah is it, well, that one was obvious i mean that was such an exceptional case so obviously you know i set them up with a weighted scoring risk assessment matrix and you know showed them how to use it um and they you know then they could put their <laughs> their uh, what's going on in their heads onto the onto the uh, matrix oh, and actually paper. evidence what they were doing yeah right because at the end of the day it's all about showing you demonstrating yeah. to the regulator your thinking behind your thought processes because mm -hmm. everybody's a little bit different yeah and you've got to always always be thinking of that you know in any in any aspect is you know is this is this good enough is this information good enough for someone coming in you know a regulator mm -hmm. auditor or whoever are they going to understand what's going on in this file? Um, right. You know, just without me saying anything. That's what you've always got to be thinking of when you're thinking of recording and evidencing your your work. Right. Okay. And what's the most common gap that you've come across? Um, I think, in terms of risk assessment itself, it's it's that um, firms aren't updating their process um, mm -hmm. in line with you know internal updates. So it might be things that have come up in their you know, business-wide risk assessment, 
or changes in products or services or something or you know maybe legislative or sanctions changes and things like that so you know you need to make sure that it's it's not just a fixed sort of uh, process that it's being updated um as needed okay that's a good one because i have seen too where when I, if i'm working with somebody um making sure they document what their trigger events are you know mm -hmm. not just we're going to review our procedures every one to two years but we're going to review our procedures when we hire a new compliance officer or when we offer out a new product or service yes. or when we uh, acquire, implement a new system, you know, things like that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So that, that's a very common gap that I'm, I'm seeing as well. Um, just trying to think in terms of, uh, yeah, one of the ones I saw was, was uh, documenting the, the periodic review or the ongoing monitoring requirement procedures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I see a lot of people where they just kind of say, "Yeah, we're going to review all our high risk once a year, once a year, or every six mm -hmm. months, um, and yeah. our normal or low risk every couple of years, something like that." Um, but documenting what is going on whenever you are doing your your periodic reviews or your ongoing monitoring procedures, mm -hmm. uh, documenting that is a is a common gap that I see. Yeah, definitely. Um, and what, if anything, is a common practice? that you would want to transform? Um, I don't know, it's a, it's a tough one really, this, with this, this is um, a common practice. I don't know, I think just generally speaking, um, I think there's a bit of a lack of understanding uh, about the whole risk assessment process and how it kind of fits into everything that, that you're doing when you're onboarding or, you know, or um, of a, for ongoing monitoring uh, with your customer I think I think people staff need to kind of pull out a little bit and see the big picture I think that's what yeah. I see is that it's like it's looked at as a single thing and then they move on to the next thing whatever that is you know you know getting all their documents in and and blah blah but you you know I think really looking at it in its entirety um, I would like to see as being more common if that makes sense yeah yeah, and and it's it's funny that you say that because that's exactly what I was kind of saying. It was you know looking at that bigger picture when onboarding, mm -hmm. and I was particularly uh, focused on the reliance on data service providers to identify things like PEPs and high risk mm -hmm. persons, uh, and you know just kind of want to say just because somebody's name is not in a particular database does not mean that they are not high risk or that they Absolutely. are not a PEP. Uh, you really have to, especially in the smaller jurisdictions, like I work a lot with, you know, in the Caribbean and, you know, you know, a, a smaller jurisdiction might have some PEPs that, you know, that you would say, hey, that person's a PEP, but is not necessarily in a bigger screening uh, providers database simply because it's a yeah. smaller jurisdiction. So absolutely. And and you can always, um, you know, that, well, first first point to that is that, you know, you you have to have local a bit of local knowledge in that case and, and understand right. you know who you're, who you're dealing with and do further checks on that person um you know because right. if you're if you're looking at them anyway you're going to see what they do for a living and xyz and you can't go oh okay they're you know uh technically a pet but they're not on you know whatever screening tool you're using so i won't class on this one so that's absolutely right. correct you don't just use that and, and then the other thing is um, that I think people don't realise is you can reach out to your screening tool and say, by the way, this person is a pet and here's why. And, you yes. know, they'll add them. They'll add them if, if they agree with you, they'll add them to the, the database. So you're kind of helping them as well and other yeah. people. Yeah. No, and we do that several times. <laughs> reach mm, out to, yeah. to the screening yeah. tools and say, hey, this one didn't yeah. pop up. Can we get it added? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I've done that. Okay. So um, this is a, a slide that I, I put together because I have seen people use this kind of matrix before. Uh, and although it says it's a qualitative risk assessment because you know they kind of do a little some factoring there. Um, my issue with this is that it is still very subjective because you're having to make the call before something happens of the probability and severity of an incident. Um, so, you know, I, I still think it's, it's, it's quite subjective uh, when you're onboarding a, a client. One of the things that I've 
you know, whenever I was kind of in the hot seat and trying to do the risk grading, was always trying to look at somebody and saying, okay, if they hit the press in five years from now, have I done everything um, that I could do now? Have I done everything today that could tell me if this person's going to hit the hit the news in five years? Is mm. being a money launderer or being involved in terrorist financing or you know, of course, you know, we're also looking at business risk as well, reputational risk. Is this person going to hit the headlines for fraud or accounting fraud or, you know, tax evasion or something like that? So it's a kind of a, a heavy, um, you know, burden to bear uh, for the, you know, traditional analyst whenever they're having to to think about that when they're trying to protect their, their um, firms or companies, um, you yeah. know, reputation yeah. as well. Um, yeah, I, I completely agree. Yeah, so it's a quite stressful job, really. Um, then, of course, our three criteria that we're really going to be talking about today is the country and geographic risk, products and services risk, and of course, the client risk. Uh, those are the, the the scope of today's conversation. Uh, I do realize that a lot of businesses, whenever they are onboarding um, new clients or customers, they are also looking at, again, that reputational risk, they might be looking at credit risk um, and any kind of, you know, any kind of other, you know, business-related risk. But we are really focusing today on just the AML and, um, you know, terrorist financing risk of your client or customer. Um, but to go back to why, you know, kind of our comments earlier about some onboarding procedures are so complex is because I do think they take into consideration. Uh, the more complex onboarding procedures might take into consideration, you know, the business risk, reputational risk, and credit risk of a new new customer or client. So uh, it could very well be that uh, your onboarding um, procedures do consider those factors as well. Um, so just kind of expand a little bit more. Uh, you know, I don't. What do you want to kind of kick off on? Let's talk a little bit about the the country and geographic risk of um, mm. the risk assessment procedures. And these are just a little, a few bullet points uh, that we've added to yeah. our slides today uh, to give you some takeaways. Um, so Corinna, what, what are you seeing when, when you see your clients looking at country and geographic risk? Yeah, so um, you know, you've got to ask yourself, you know, a series of questions to understand, you know, where, you know, about jurisdictions, countries, you know, where is your customer based? Where are they sending money to or receiving money from? Things like that. Have they got any assets in there? You know, where are they? Um, where are they held? So you're asking yourself all of those questions. But then, you know, once you know that, you've obviously got to apply, um, you know, well, what does that mean? Are any of those countries high risk? And then, you know, how do I know if it's high risk? Um, you know that's that's such an important thing. You know you you're going to have your your databases and your lists and and what have you. Um, mm -hmm. But are you sure that you've got you know up to date current information? Um, you know, uh, uh, Kim, you mentioned um, previously uh, in one of our conversations about um, you know how quickly things can change you know and so you've got to make sure that you're up to date with that at all times so that you know um that when you're asking these questions uh, and looking at these risk factors for a customer um uh, that you're able to you know correctly apply it and um right. and help with your overall assessment right and i think this is a, a particularly tricky area for those who are listening in who have international client and customer portfolios. Um, I mean, just taking, you know, the whole Russia, Ukraine. So, you know, let's look at some context of what's going on, you know, today, mid-February 2022. We've got, uh, you know, the situation in, in, in Ukraine on the Ukrainian border uh, going on that can change in a heartbeat, according to US media, at least. I don't know what the rest of the world is reporting. Um, but we also have situations like like the the trucker convoy in Canada. I don't know if that's hitting the press uh, over in the UK right now, but that's a it's kind of you know mainstream you know media here. And mm. no, not, the, I've not seen that yet. Oh, okay. So yeah. So apparently the um, there's a situation where there's a GoFundMe. The the, tr the truckers are protesting. 
uh, against the vaccine mandates in Canada. And there was a big GoFundMe uh, raise that raised like uh, $10 million um, in, in donations to support those truckers who are not working right now because they're protesting. It's been going on for a couple of weeks. Right. And of course, uh, then, you know, so, and long story short, you, everybody can kind of look it up afterwards. But long story short, apparently now um, in ca Canada, and don't quote me on this because it, the, the news is always changing. Apparently, if you, uh, the Canadian government is saying if uh, trying to monitor Canadian banks uh, to see who donated, if, if, that, I mean, that's just what I heard this morning. <laughs> I just thought I would not want to be a compliance officer in at a Canadian bank right now, uh, simply because of that. So, wow. um, yeah, so there's that that's going on. And yeah, just just so much. It's just daily. Um, and those are two yeah. really yeah. big things going on. Um, yeah. And I think it's um, it's really interesting particularly with the Ukraine one. So so any news that's coming out of the US is really, you know, as you said, very sort of strongly worded towards, you know, potential war. Um, right. And it's kind of the same here, you know, um, but then I was listening to, um, you know, one of the major newspapers podcasts and, you know, they were speaking to ordinary people on the ground in Ukraine. And, mm -hmm. you know, they were just kind of going about their business and, you know, right. not, all right, yes, worried, yes, concerned that something awful is going to happen. But, you know, they're not kind of hiding away in bunkers or anything like that at the moment. So, it, you know, you don't know where you are. And right. I think right. there's a danger, isn't there, of getting caught up in, in all of this stuff. But until, you know, there are, let's say, sanctions placed upon a country or upon um, certain uh, transactions, um, etc. What can you do apart from, st you know, stay, stay as um, up to date as you possibly can? Mm -hmm. um, you know, how, how far do you go with like changing um, procedures and things like that without, you know, when at the moment it's just a story in the news and not really anything concrete, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Kind of, you don't want to be too reactive. Yeah. But at the same time, your your assessment procedures need to think about, OK, if I'm onboarding somebody today who has, you know, high uh, connect, you know, has connections to, you know, Russian government, for instance. Mm. How, how is that going to look six months down the road when, you know, NATO and Russia are at war mm. kind of thing? Mm. So and, and or and does that, in, you know, impact? Us. again it, it might not depending on, on where you are so yeah, um, yeah. yeah and the products and services I, I think that that goes back again to this kind of proper evidencing of things so mm -hmm. you know if you're in a real tricky sort of quandary about um, a customer or a change in a customer due to something like that you know have a conversation you know sit with um, you know the people within your firm or external consultants if you need you know additional expertise and go through it and you know take minutes of your meeting and write it all down and, and then talk about you know write down how you've um reached your decision about whether to keep that client for example you know if you can demonstrate your thought processes um and you know the rationale for all of the decisions then i th always think that that helps you know yeah yeah absolutely it's good okay one of the the other the second one products and services risk and this is actually one of the other gaps that i see where people don't um or businesses do not do a a full business risk assessment and actually look at every single product or service that they provide break it down and then analyze it from a okay could this be used for money laundering could this this product that i'm providing be used for you know terrorist financing and um and i appreciate you actually put in some examples things like the pooled accounts fiduciary deposits uh and things like that so um but that that's another aspect in the kind of the three criteria when you're looking at the assessment that i've seen is that you want to think about it i've seen a lot of people just look at country like national somebody's nationality mm -hmm. and address um to to determine a risk rating and they don't actually look at what um 
that particular customer client is wanting from them. Do you, do you see the same yeah. thing as yeah. well? Yeah, abs absolutely. And it's so key. It's such a key part of it. Um, you know, what what do they, you know, what service do they want from you and why? And does it fit with, you know, their profile, uh, you know, and the types of customers you, you typically have? Um, yeah, I, th I think that's, you know, like you say, we've got some examples there as well mm -hmm. so you've got to look at um the risk of that so because you might have one type of customer using a, a, a service um but because of who they are and where they are uh that service is less risky you know so you've got to, again you're looking at all of those aspects together but you certainly can't just leave that out altogether and in a broader sense you need to be looking at your product and services risk again at that um you know your business-wide risk assessment um, you know, I see quite often, um, like I mentioned earlier, that, you know, uh, businesses will start providing a new service or product, but they haven't assessed it for risk, generally speaking. Um, right. And you must, you know, you must do that. Yes, absolutely. Especially when there's so many new things going on out there. I mean, I was, I mm. think just in the past couple of years, I mean, we've got, uh, is it, is it NFTs? We've got SPACs, mm. we've got all the cryptocurrencies. I see, you know, um, initial coin offerings. That was a big deal a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I mean, and whether or not that is maybe a, a source of somebody's wealth or funds, you've got to think mm. about it, or if it's a product or service that you're providing, or somehow that's, that's somehow you have to also think about if your client is involved in these new technologies or mm. new methods or, or just <laughs> something new that's out there because it seems like every couple of years there's some big thing going on um yeah. in the technology yeah. world yeah. yeah and then you find yourself having to gen up on all of that and suddenly oh, yeah. become an expert <laughs> overnight which is just not possible so <laughs> you yeah. know I, mean, I, was, I was even thinking about like yeah, I was even thinking about ICOs the other day. I mean, it was, I think it was a couple of years ago, ICOs, initial coin offerings were just, mm -hmm. just, it was, they seem to be happening constantly. And, and yeah. I don't know, maybe I've just tuned them out, but I, I'm not hearing about them anymore. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And the other ones that uh, I was kind of trying to pay attention to, you know, again, a year ago were, were SPACs, which was well, special purpose acquisition companies. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that's a big deal elsewhere in the world but here in the US you know you know they they kind of became quite quite uh, popular so I was kind of trying to learn about those as well okay um, the the third <clears throat> item is the uh, customer risk and we won't go into peps in detail because that is a webinar in itself but obviously as we kind of mentioned you know talking you know finding out if your customer is a pep and not just relying on those those uh, databases to um you know confirm that somebody's a pep or not but you know using the knowledge that you have on your purpose on your on your individual um and things like the purpose of the relationship uh i do find a lot of people um or a lot of businesses don't really think about that and maybe because it's so um intuitive of course you know if i'm a law firm they're coming to us for legal advice or my accounting firm, you know, maybe, you know, they're coming to us for accounting advice or so maybe that's the reason why it's not really documented uh, as often as I'd like to see. Uh, are you are you seeing the same thing mm -hmm. where the purpose of the relationship is not well documented? Um, I, I mean, it can be, but it's it's from what I see here in the UK, that sort of nature of the relationship tends to be a thing that is, you know, explicitly asked um, mm -hmm. how how deeply people go into it depends on you know what's uh, who you know what that service is particularly or what the firm is um but yeah it, i yeah i do i do see it um fairly regularly um but i think you're right i think there is that uh it's kind of baked in as well isn't it into yeah. you know everything else you're doing when you're onboarding uh, a customer um you know why they're using your services, you know, what they do for a living, that sort of thing. So you should be kind of gathering all of that information anyway. Okay. Um, durational relationship. I mean, I think in some regulations, they say you don't have to do diligence on just, you know, if it's under a certain threshold or if it's just kind of a one-off relationship. I don't know if that's still the case globally. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's certainly uh, the case in Europe and uh, and the UK. Um, so you can have one-off transactions or under a, a certain threshold, um, mm -hmm. and you know then it's like minimal uh, information. So you might take an ID um, and okay. just get a na name, address, date of birth, but you know all the rest of it um, is not necessary in those cases. Yeah. But of course, you still have to think of terms of that was a one-off, but then as you come back again, six months later, yes. it's another one. Yeah, so you have to think and about yeah, that. So, yeah, yeah, you find it in uh, money service businesses um, right. predominantly. Uh, and, you know, they, they need to be using technologies um, where they can uh, pick up, you know, if someone's kind of starting, uh, you know, if they're um, if they've got linked transactions, for example, so they've they've sent um, their transfer. It's a small amount one day, then they send another one the next day and the next day and the next day. Well, yeah. then it's become a linked amount, and you know you've got to look at it. But you know, a lot of um, software uh, technologies that they're using will pick that up. Right. Okay. And. Um, the delivery channel risks, such as the, and of course, uh, I, think, I think the phrase delivery channel um, means things to, is is different to to some. I've always seen delivery channel is, is how they came to you, how, how they, mm -hmm. um, you know, started using your business. And uh, again, that might be, you know, like an introduction, um, some intermediate, like a law firm intermediate, you know, kind of introducing the business to you. Um, but then there's also, some people are like, well, the delivery channel is also how they do um, business with their customer. Is it always via email? Is it always through? I mean, do they ever meet face to face? Um, yeah. Is it all? I mean, it's like a bank might be. Well, most of our trans, you know, most of our banking is done online. Mm -hmm. So, so the, you do think about you know what type of industry you are in and that delivery channel risk as well, and what it means to you as far as and what it means to your regulator uh, as well. Because I think the regulations. Yeah. Different. different and and obviously that you know that changed if you were a business that was more handshake and face to face before now mm -hmm. we're you know uh in the pandemic post pandemic whatever <laughs> right um, you know it, all of that has changed for so many firms and so you've got to make sure that your uh, risk assessment you know has kept up with that if you're no longer right. to meet, able to meet people. And it's those types of businesses that tend to be high risk customers anyway, you know, the ones that mm -hmm. where you are meeting them uh, typically before onboarding them. Uh, it's usually because you're dealing with, you know, maybe high net worth uh, individuals or, um, or, or something like that. So you've got to make sure that, okay, if you're not meeting them face to face, are you absolutely sure you're dealing with, you know, who they say they are? Absolutely. And um, interestingly enough, because I, I was even kind of thinking, okay, well, even a, a, a conference, a video conference, for instance, for a new client, is that deemed face to face if you're seeing them, um, mm -hmm. you know, on a conference? And of course, and then, but then there's another question. We did a webinar, uh, it was last, I think it was last September on deep fakes and how somebody mm -hmm. could fake a, a video call and you think you're, speaking to you know matt damon for instance you know because he's, you know, everybody knows his face um but somebody could fake you know that uh their image and yet it's moving mm -hmm. around and so you know, it looks like you're speaking to matt damon um mm -hmm. so uh and i thought that was very interesting as well so that just kind of throws another wrench in the, in the uh, it, it, it does it, it does and it doesn't so i'm so fascinated with things like that um, yeah but i think you know, although the technology is there, it's still so complex and complicated and so few people know how to do it yeah. extremely yeah. effectively that I think at this stage, you know, you'd have to be an extremely determined criminal to be <laughs> going through <laughs> those measures. And like, you know, and it's got to be so economically worth it to you to have, yeah. you know, to have gone through that. So I think the chances are pretty slim, but yeah, that's just now. I mean, that stuff's out there, and who knows how quickly? You know, we know we know already how quickly technologies develop. Um, yeah. So yeah, certainly always worth keeping up to date with things like that. Yeah, yeah. To just figure out how the because they are coming up with some new and interesting and creative ways. 
And of course, mm. uh, that size and type of transaction, we were kind of talking about that and how, how they could be linked. Um, but then also, does the transaction make commercial sense? Mm. Um, that's, you know, again, uh, this is probably especially true for, for law firms who are you know, providing advice uh, and contracts in, in these big commercial uh, deals, uh, making sure that they understand the flow of the money and, uh, and that it does make all sense. Mm -hmm. um, and does it align with the client profile? That's mm -hmm. another key one that I think a lot of people probably miss um, as well. I don't know if you've had any experience with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's a massive red flag, isn't it? If, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you've got a transaction that just does not make sense, but you've got to be, you know, your your processes have to enable you to spot that. So, OK, if you're a smaller firm with a smaller client portfolio where you kind of know them individually, you tend to be better at spotting those sorts of things. But, um, you know, much larger firms where there's a lot more automation, you know, Mm -hmm. it, are your are your automated uh, processes able to capture things like that? It's, it's really important. Right. Uh, one of the examples that I have of this is when you're, I mean, so for for corporate um, entities that you have to kind of drill down and look into, you know, directors and shareholders and management. Um, you know, and I've come across this where where suddenly somebody's appointed to the board. <clears throat> that whenever and and in one part of me you, you kind of have this this internal fight it's like well is it my job to decide who can be appointed to the board no <laughs> you know it's it's the shareholders you know jobs and 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 you know however that company set up uh but then sometimes looking at somebody who's getting appointed to a to a board and realizing that you know that they have absolutely no experience in that particular mm -hmm. industry that that particular company is supposed to be um operating and then having to question why is that person so, you know, maybe they're they're they have experience elsewhere, but but just kind of you know, and, and it's not necessarily saying okay, I'm going to make them higher risk because they have no none of that experience and why they're they're appointed to the to that board, but just kind of making a mental note or even documenting it that mm -hmm. you know, because I mean I I was always thinking in terms of of are they being paid a bribe and this is how they're getting yeah. paid by you know by saying okay we'll point you to the board you don't have to do anything but we'll, you know we'll give you 100 grand a year um to grease the wheels yeah. or something like that yeah exactly i it's really important it's important to uh note those things like properly note those things and properly note how how you've dealt with them um, right you know something like that always ask questions you should be able to ask questions um, mm -hmm. And if you get real pushback on those questions, again, that's a red flag, isn't it? Um, yeah. You know, yeah. You, you've got to, if something isn't making sense to you, you've got to keep digging until it does. And if it never does, then it's, you know, you have to start questioning whether you can onboard something like that or continue with with, uh, with that customer. Yeah. I think there would have to be a few red flags that go up. Mm -hmm. um, that being one of them, you know, if, if I was concerned about, you know, somebody's um, sitting on a board. Um, the other thing, going back to the kind of like the the type of transaction, I, take it, um, I think I did a, a webinar where we, uh, a couple months ago, we were talking about, and I brought up, I don't know if it, this made the news worldwide, but it was the uh, college admission scandal where mm, uh, coaches yeah, yeah. were getting paid, some of them up to 100, uh, 100 grand, 500 grand a year, uh, or That's not a year, right. but you know, a transaction uh, as a bribe to then get some of these um, uh, students accepted, you know, into mm -hmm. certain colleges. Um, so I don't know if that made kind of world news, but I remember kind of thinking, did, how yeah. did those people, yeah, how did those those coaches get that half a million dollar payment into their banks? <laughs> it's, it's, you know, when yeah. I'm sure their salary was probably less than a hundred grand, or, or maybe you know, hundred, you know, something, and all of a sudden they get this this big chunk of change, did their banks not question that, you know? Mm. Um, so that's- Yeah, that's or, or how, there, there was the guy, wasn't there? The, the guy who was like the central, you know, um, character in it. Uh, yes, who was he, yeah, he was the one that was paying. Um, yeah, yeah. So parents were yeah. paying so him. I, he, I imagine he was kind of papering, you know, creating the necessary paper trails 
because he was so shady that guy wasn't he yeah um, yeah with all the things he was doing there's quite a few famous people weren't there that yeah yeah quite having actually, having I mean, got their their kids into college yeah uh, through those means yeah yeah that that was just kind of an interesting case to to, to mm -hmm. follow as well um so yeah and you know of course looking at the beneficiaries of transaction this is probably a little bit uh more related for those trusting uh corporate service providers you know especially people who are setting up trusts um in the states uh for wealth managers uh and of course also looking at what the transaction itself is related to um so such as you know the the arms and metals and cultural artifacts um religious anything that has religious significance mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're especially looking mostly i think for especially in the the war-torn um countries where mm -hmm. archaeological items and historical items can be um kind of stolen from that country and yeah and sold on the black yeah market. and you've got to be so careful just just to touch on on that sort i mean obviously it's a whole other webinar to talk about um you know mm -hmm. evidencing um transactions and source of wealth and things like that but you know it's such an important thing and if it if you don't have the expertise to do it because some of these things can be so you know uh, particular can't they um yeah yeah you, know, you have to you have to consider whether you can take it on you know and don't just go oh, well i don't really know much about that but i'm sure it's fine <laughs> you know yeah um you, you know you've got to you know, does it fall within your risk appetite to to do a transaction like that and within your expertise yeah um, and, and if not you know you shouldn't be doing it yeah and this kind of reveals right here i mean we're only talking about three things three you know criteria that we're looking at for our risk assessment but how detailed these can go you know when you, when you start digging down so you almost have to have you know geopolitical knowledge what's going on in the world you know, stay very much up to date, um, you know, stay up to date as far as, you know, particular um, assets, <laughs> stay up to date on, mm -hmm. on business transaction, what's current, you know, so it's, it's a, again, it's a heavy load to bear for, you know, one analyst to do, um, if you have a very wide uh, client portfolio, mm -hmm. um, that's doing a little bit of everything. Uh, so you can imagine that this is this mentally uh, hard uh, for for the average analyst, and so they will need a lot more support, just in constant training, I think, um, mm -hmm. so they can stay on on top of this as well as maybe, as you say, kind of in being able to have somebody you know outsource that they can call on that might have a bit more mm -hmm. experience and. Um, yeah, people have to be careful, careful because you know you try and do all this yourself. I think you and I have both been in this situation uh, many years ago something. where, you know, yeah, and it's, you know, you're, you're expected to know everything about everything, but, but the, the thing I always think is you don't know what you don't know. And so, yeah. you know, it, it's you've always got to reach out, um, you know, into the compliance community and get further expertise and not try and take on all of this, um, all of this yourself if it's very complicated. Um, right it's it's uh there's a lot of lone uh compliance people out there in the smaller firms and you know just i would say is particularly to them be careful and make sure that you're um you're using external resources as well right and and to the senior management i would say you know make sure you you budget uh in your annual budgets those resources for them and again it it, it could just be again um ongoing training uh, going to conferences, uh, you know, attending attending conferences virtually, um, where they do dive down deeper into these particular um, things. So mm, I went to absolutely. one. Absolutely, uh, I was attending one uh, last September, and there was a particular topic on just China. You know, onboarding a Chinese mm -hmm. client, and I just thought it was fascinating because there was just so much just on that one nationality that I hadn't, you know, did not know about. And I thought that is just, I was like, gosh, that, that's a whole day of learning right there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 So there's, there's so much. That's what I would say to, yeah, to the senior management, whenever you're looking at your, your budgets for compliance, just do bear in mind, it's, you know, if you have an international client portfolio or customer, you know, portfolio, this is some of the things that your analysts is having to, to think about. Um, 
Mm -hmm. um, let's move on to a little bit about waiting because I have seen customers that use waiting. Even the silo system, there's there's some ability to do some waiting as mm -hmm. well. And for and I thought your your comments were really good as far as because I have seen this, especially this this third one here. Waiting should not be unduly influenced by just one factor. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen that. Uh, as well as the attempt to work their waiting to where it was almost impossible to classify any of their clients as high risk. Mm. And so yes. clearly, since yes. you wrote that, I, I'm assuming you've come across the same thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, because I mean, in the UK and you know many places around the world, uh, we work under the risk-based approach. Um, you know, it means that you know you're not completely prescribed. Uh, how you have to do these things so it's up to firms to figure out um you know how they they make these uh, matrices um mm -hmm. but having said that you know there are regulations um uh in the uk and in other countries and you've got to follow those so you, you know whilst they'll be tailored to your business and your customer base and your firm um you know they still have to be within uh those regulations and that's that's the the key area and it's interesting that just going back to the um shouldn't be unduly influenced by one factor and that's true uh, but um not to be confused with you know if you have a pep uh, in your risk rating um right. you know and nothing else is high risk about the business that file is still going to be high risk likely not always um, but it depends on the level of PEP, but, you know, you could actually, there are some uh, scenarios where it could be influenced by a single factor, but, um, you know, it, it would be clear in the file why, why it was. Right. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Um, moving on to the escalation. Uh, this is something else where uh, I have seen a little bit, I'm seeing more escalation. Uh, or where something's high risk or has certain factors, they might get moved up to somebody more in senior management or even the board uh, before uh, a client can be onboarded. You know, so I am seeing more of it, but I think I'd say 10 years ago, I almost rarely saw it. Um, yeah. Especially, and this is actually really hard in the smaller firms too, because sometimes there's no one to escalate it to. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you do have that problem. Um, but yeah, being able to document that that you do have an escalation procedure uh, in place, um, and it could be to where it's not just necessarily the client risk. Maybe this is where it, it's so focused on if the client is high risk, maybe it gets escalated. But I think some people forget about that product and service risk as well. Maybe there should even be some products or services that if somebody comes in and is needing it, it has to be signed off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, one that springs to mind um, that, uh, you know, more a few years ago, but still still see it every now and again, is a tier one investor visas over here, which is mm -hmm. like the, the gold, golden visa they were called before. I mean, immediately, um, you know, you, could, you would see that product uh, as high risk, but, you know, many of the firms offering that didn't. You might look at they, again. They'd look at the customer because often right. they were coming from high risk jurisdictions. But you know that product itself, I think, um, is by its very nature. Mm -hmm. And and I also kind of wrote, you know, to you know senior management boards. They they really need to say be welcoming to escalation procedures. Mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of senior management, and especially when they get to board level, you know, compliance might not be their their strengths or their fourth, they might not know anything about it. Uh, maybe there needs to be somebody um, who's assigned in senior management or on the board to um, accept those uh, and kind of you know take them on board themselves. So it's not just kind of going generally yeah. to a big board, uh, but those kind of things also need to be, again, those these escalation need, needs to be kind of welcomed by them and addressed as to who's gonna be the one, the one person in senior management or the one person on the board. Going yeah, to that's, that's right. And, and, you know, depending on the size of your firm, you know, you should have, um, you know, terms of reference for your 
uh, committees or you know, board and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, yeah. And over here in the UK, that you know there should be someone um, you know at that level who is in control of uh, AML. You know they're not doing necessarily doing all the day to day, but there should be a right. person that's assigned uh, with that responsibility. Um, right. So you, you'd expect that you know they would be involved in in any sort of escalation there. Mm -hmm. And so some and firms have separate uh, risk committees as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, those are usually the, the larger firms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've got more people that can <laughs> make yeah. up all the committees. <laughs> Lucky them. Yeah. Um, and of course, there, there might be certain triggers too you want to doc document. So, for instance, because I mean, like I know, you know in the Caribbean, there's a lot of you know specific certification wording that has to be followed. So maybe you know maybe that's a trigger event. I know that's kind of frustrating for for some, uh, or maybe some news article was found, you know, um, that on the on the person that may, maybe you want to think about whether or not that is a trigger event that gets escalated as well mm. um, and of course uh, if that risk rating or score um, increases at any time so you might onboard somebody you know in their medium or low risk uh, but then something happens and then suddenly they they become higher risk so whenever whether that's through your you know ongoing monitoring process that you discover that they're higher risk or maybe have some kind of automation going on uh, maybe that uh, again, it needs to be escalated up. And you know, and just to, to point out, you know, anytime you do have a high risk, I think most regulations require that you then have to do enhanced due diligence, and often that means getting source of wealth, source of funds. And I do realize that's the reason why so many people try and and they shy away from making somebody high risk mm. uh, because they don't like that extra work, really. Um, but yeah, I personally don't have a problem with making somebody high risk. There's always a way to you know to do that enhanced due diligence and mm -hmm. get that source of wealth, you know, document that source of wealth and source of funds. Absolutely, which we are not going to go into because again, that's a whole another topic. It's, yeah, I, I think that goes back to, just briefly to say that you know that's about senior management looking at budgets for their compliance teams because if you're mm -hmm. shying away from high risk because it increases frequency you know, you're probably overburdened with work, which means you need more, you know, more hands to help. Right. Um, you know, there shouldn't be any any sort of shying away from that. Right, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, next slide is about ongoing monitoring. Um, I see, this is one of my more common gaps that I, I see people missing, is documenting how they do their periodic reviews. Uh, I see they'll they'll document things like they'll say okay if they're high risk I'll I'll review them once a year and if they're low risk I'll review them every three years something something like that um, but they don't document what that review process looks like so it's not just how frequently but what what does it entail and also the event triggers uh, that would also trigger a, a a a review like before that that once a year once every three years you know review. Um, so that's just something that I, 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 I have seen uh, to the point where I even wrote an article. So maybe I, I remember I'll even try whenever I send out the recording of this, uh, I'll try to attach that article. But if not, you can always go to our website on Silo. So I'll send a link to that at least um, uh, about ongoing monitoring and what, um, what you might want to add. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you, you probably see similar situations. Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, period reviews are funny sometimes. They seem to get a bit left behind. It's like, oh yeah, we, we do do this. But when you're looking at a firm's processes, that they're sometimes just not as clear um, right. as, as uh, the onboarding processes. Um, and yeah, the, the actual keeping, you know, customer information up to date, um, you know, can be a little bit light touch and you know like you say not putting their precise triggers down you know what would actually trigger um you know a review outside of you know the normal one right um, so yeah uh, you know firms really need to to treat that as as carefully as they do with onboarding because that is you know like you put at the end uh, of the slide there that's how you're mitigating your risk mm -hmm. you know by checking um, regularly 
how regularly depends on the risk as we've said um, right. but you need to you need to be you know going through that risk class that's another thing that i see um often doesn't happen is they don't reclassify the risk as a whole you know they don't go through that weighted scoring again um yes. at review time which you should do every single time and certainly right. with a trigger some something has changed so it might be you know it might never you know the risk rating may never change throughout the life cycle of that customer but you know without testing that and documenting it how do you know right yeah absolutely so i definitely see that and of course in that that last question can review frequently mitigate risk i mean yes as far as is you know you're you're obviously you know reviewing them um but i don't think one can say well if i take this high risk person and review them every three months i'll make them normal risk so i just want to kind of make that clear that that's yeah. not what we mean there um absolutely absolutely yeah. not um it doesn't matter if you review them every every day but you're you're kind of keeping up to date with that person, their, that that company, whatever it might be, and, mm -hmm. and their risk to you as a business. Um, and you know, the more frequently you do that with a with a higher risk um, customer, the less likely you are to get caught out by something. So okay. that's really the yeah. point of that, rather than changing the actual risk um, classification itself. Okay. Coming up to the top of the hour, and again, we will take um, questions uh, from the audience here soon. One last slide before we get to the Q&A session is, you know, how, if you're listening in, what could you do to improve your current processes? Now, the one thing that I do whenever I'm working with, with somebody and as we're about to implement, you know, the, the silo system, is I like to understand their current processes. And the one thing I do is I, I do a lot of flowcharts. Um, and just understanding um, their every single step in their current process. And that really helps me figure out who does what. Um, so when we're, especially when we're configuring the system for them, uh, but then also understanding where their gaps are. Um, and I have seen that where I, I'll kind of go through their, their risk manual process, you know, procedures, and then go, well, well what happens when this happens, you know, and and because they don't have it documented uh, very well, and so we we can at least update their their manual, but then also configure the system for them better. Um, so that's something that I do. I don't, is there anything that you you do whenever you're looking at uh, a client's procedures? Mm, that's it's pretty much exactly what I do. So it, it tends to be if I'm doing, you know, if I'm helping a, a client with their procedures, I'll start with um, facilitating a um, business-wide risk assessment with them. Mm -hmm. So looking at, you know, not, not just uh, the customer risk assessment, but obviously their uh, business risk assessment. And that's that's like exactly as you've explained, it's mapping their processes. It talks about their products and services and the risk to them and, and all of that. And out of that, um, we look at and we, we see the gaps uh, that they have in their current processes and fill them in. So yeah, it's pretty much the same same process. Right. And, and just to, um, again, clarify, a lot of people think uh, workflow processes are very linear. They just step one, step two, step three, step mm -hmm. four. But that's never the case, really, in reality. Mm -hmm. The reality is you might have, you know, the, get their KYC, do some uh, due diligence and sanctions checking. But then you've got, well, then if they are normal risk, this happens. And if they're higher mm -hmm. risk, this needs to happen. Um, so it is, it's, yeah. it's more of a map as opposed to just a step-by-step -step checklist process. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And, and yeah. you've also, you know, there's also always going to be areas in there where you're going to have to kind of step out of that workflow. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's just to guide you, guide the uh, firm really, isn't it? Um, right. but you, know, you can obviously get complicated, uh, cases, but yeah, I, it's, it's such a good and important, um, starting point yeah uh, you know to ensure uniformity as well right i also see quite often a little bit of duplication um that whether it's the same question being asked but just a different way mm. especially if the client especially with onboarding forms um or you're getting one person to sign off and then 
you're also having to get another, maybe one person signs mm. up because they're a pet, but then somebody else has to sign up because they're high risk. You know, could that be eliminated, you know, that duplication? Yeah. Um, and of course, sometimes the onboarding process is again, you know, about business risk, credit risk, you know, rep you know, reputation risk, not just AML and, and terrorist financing risk. Um, and also just the, this is how we've always done it. Mm. Um, oh. you know, mentality. <laughs> <laughs> so, that is such a bugbear of mine. <laughs> never say and, that to me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I hear that phrase a lot too. Yeah. Um, so if you are trying to improve your, your current processes, um, you, you may have to ask those questions. Well, why are we doing it this way? Um, and you may have to pick your battles uh, as well. Sometimes you just can't, you know, you, you just got to work with the culture and your in your, you know, your company. Maybe you've got other divisions, departments that you have to work with. Uh, so you may have to pick your battles and just do a, a, an improvement at a time instead of all at once. So which which is which is perfectly fine, too. Um, yeah. yeah. Any other ideas for uh, improving processes that that we haven't kind of mentioned here? I think uh, just just touching on that duplication. I think that that certainly you see that a lot in in uh, long running firms um, where you know processes get laid on top of processes, and you know um, I think in those cases get a fresh pair of eyes on on everything, even if it's like a, a you know any staff member it doesn't even have to be external but you get a staff member who's joined recently to have a look and you know talk through that stuff um as a newbie uh, right. and just just kind of freshen it up and and don't just keep adding and adding and adding make sure that what, everything you've got there is entirely essential um right. otherwise you've just got this really burdensome um process that nobody enjoys mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So we'll we'll take some questions. Um, uh, right now, I don't have any questions, but I'm sure some might might come in as we go on. Um, I'm looking at somebody wrote a comment, and of course, and it probably came in when we were talking about something. They're talking about the assets. Maybe it was an automatic um, risk trigger that if they had assets over a billion, they were immediately high risk. Below that was low risk. They say that's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, that that nothing in between. A, what's that? Nothing in between. <laughs> nothing in between. Exactly. <laughs> so if they're really wealthy, they're high risk. If they're not so wealthy, they're low risk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I can see that being questioned by a by an, an auditor. Um, still don't have any new questions coming in, uh, unless I'm just missing them. Um, but but thank you for that uh, comment. Sorry, I'm having a hard time viewing my. Uh, my screen here. Uh, Hi, as as Kimberly. It's, uh, Tom here, just jumping yeah. in. Uh, there are a couple of questions there. Okay, sorry, oh, I'm not I'm seeing any. You can scroll no. through. Yeah, for some anything. reason, it's not letting me scroll through. Uh, do you mind uh, asking the questions, Tom? Sure, as long as you promise to answer them. <laughs> um, <laughs> no. Should there be a certain percentage of high slash medium slash low risk clients overall in a firm's book of business? Oh, that's a great question. That and, was asked yeah. by Samantha. I, I will say that um, it you should I don't think you should ever have no high risks. As a matter of fact, I think that could be a trigger for some auditors if you say you have no high risk. Do you agree? I, yeah, I yeah I do. I think really because it's not about obviously reaching certain percentages, is it, of each of those? But your your firm would do well to have a risk appetite document, a statement of of some description. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have to be massive, but just something where you really set out um, what you're willing to take on, and then you know you can see from your um, percentages of if you're going past that, um, but but yeah, if you, I mean, you might say, you know, if anyone, if any customer that we're onboarding falls into anything above low risk, we're not going to onboard them. So you could conceivably have only low risk in your portfolio, but you'd have to have a document like, like you said, Kimberly, because um, an auditor would kind of want to understand that. Uh, right. The document would say we don't take on. Yeah, you know, I've seen that before. Some businesses say okay. we just simply don't take on high risk clients. So if they uh 
come up in the risk matrix as high risk, they're not going to be onboarded. Right. And I think you need to also remember to log those that you, mm. you decline. Absolutely. Um, so you, yeah. So you can show your auditor, or your regulator, your auditor, look, we have had people come on, but we've turned them away because they, you know, according to our matrix or according to our scoring method, you know, they fell into the high risk. So mm. these were the ones that came in, you know, log who they are, when they came on, you know, what, what factors made them high risk and mm document that you did you know deny the business yeah that's super important point because i see that often in terms of processes that's usually completely missing from yeah. uh, you know aml policies is exiting business and declining business yeah. um because you know yes in any situation you must you know uh, like you just said state why you did that but then more right. importantly, you know, it could be for reasons of suspicions. And if you just exited because you're suspicious, but then you didn't file a report, well, that's a problem. So you need yeah. to be really clear about why you're doing things and, and how you followed up if you needed to. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. And as far as like having a percentage, what's a, I mean, are you seeing any kind of percentage threshold that firms have or, or different types of firms or are they saying you know, no, we'll, we'll, no. we'll take on 5% or we'll take on 10%? Mm. I don't usually see that. So it's, it's a really interesting question because I don't typically see that. It's, um, mm -hmm. it's usually just to do with what they're willing to take on uh, and yeah. what their services are. So, you know, firms vary. Some firms, their products are pretty low risk and other firms, um, you know, they are by their nature offering pretty high risk products. And so they are going to have big percentages of high risk clients, but their processes, the important thing about it is that your processes need to cope with that and your expertise need to cope with that as well. Yeah. So that's that's really the side you're looking at it from. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it's very interesting because I remember when we were showing uh, our technology to a regulator once, uh, one of the things that they definitely wanted to see on, on the main dashboard was the percentage of high risk clients. Um, in, in you know that's you know maintaining that system and he specifically said it's because if we have somebody who has like 20 percent high-risk clients we're going to be then looking at the quality of their their risk processes and their budget do they have the resources do they have the tools to take on a larger percentage of high-risk clients yeah that so, makes perfect and, sense exactly yeah and so, now that was like you know eight years ago so um, I'm, I'm sure that's probably still very much the same. So if you do have a high high percentage of high risk clients, um, you're going to want to be able to back up uh, to a regulator to show that you have the resources to manage yeah. that. And that will be the ongoing reviews, you know, the screening, um, you know, and the day to day, you know, onboarding process as well. Okay. Yeah, I have a statement here. Somebody did clarify, and thank you very much for for this wording. When we were talking about delivery channels, and I said delivery channels kind of mean a little bit different to some people, and mm -hmm. uh, they write acquisition channel versus delivery channel. And I think that's very very good um, phrasing as far as yeah. you want to look yeah. at your acquisition, how how you acquire the client versus the delivery channel, which is how you um, offer you provide that that product or service to them. So thank you. Yeah, for that's that. right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tom, any others? I'm sure there's there's others. Oh, here's one I can see. <laughs> they kind of just pop up. Um, see if I can read the question. It says assessing risk when there are various triggering factors. For example, PEP, who is a director of a publicly traded company and or its subsidiary, does the higher risk factor override the lower? Um, oh, that's a good question. So, so if, if I'm understanding the question, it's like if you have a director who is a PEP, does that high risk rating of the PEP then um, transfer to the company? Yeah, sure. um, it, it depends on. Myself. Yeah, so so that so if it's a director of the company, um, you've got to look at what you're doing for that company, um, mm -hmm. what. Because if it's a massive company and you're not actually, you know, and there's a sector that that director's got nothing to do with that is engaging your services, we might have to look at it differently to 
say a smaller firm where that director is you know is the person you're dealing with um mm. if that makes sense i'm maybe not explaining myself very well but um that you've got to look at all of those aspects i mean essentially if there's a pep involved yeah your customer that company is a pep you know you, you would apply that pep um label to it but there are <laughs> lots of factors to consider in that case yeah so maybe you would make the company high risk. Are you saying that you would make the company high risk if there's a pep involved? Yeah, I mean, if it's, if it's you know, a proper pep, you know, a, a proper high, let's say, you know, the highest like of pep. Like a tier one pep as opposed yeah, to. Yeah, exactly, exactly. As opposed to like a family was, member of a pep or something. Yeah, yeah, or, or just, you know, the real lower sort of um, in the hierarchy. Um, yeah, if it's, uh, you know, in your processes as a tier one pep, um, then that's, yeah, that is part of the company. You know, a director directs a firm. So, yeah. you know, that sort of says it all. Um, yeah. That firm is your customer and a pep is directing it. So, yeah, it should be high risk. What if there was like, um, so let's forget like the pep status. What if you had somebody who was higher risk because they are just from a certain nationality? And that's higher risk. We'll pick on Russia as an example. Let's say you've determined Russia is high risk. So anybody from Russia is high risk. Um, not that that's how you should do it, but you know, uh, if, mm -hmm. if that was your case, does that yeah. have one Russian director on the board of a yeah. maybe a UK company that's otherwise low risk? Yeah. Would that's you great. make that that's company high that's risk? Great, great example. Um, you know again it's it, you are looking you know we keep saying the same thing really don't we but you're looking at all the different factors so you know russian nationality but does that director live in russia um what does the company do i mean you just said in your example that it's otherwise low risk so mm -hmm. you know, perhaps what it's using you know what what services it's using um mm -hmm. and where it's transacting to and from are not high risk so why would that single factor uh make it high risk yeah okay i think we're on the same page there mm -hmm. so um yeah i think the the answer the short answer is case by case <laughs> yeah um, <laughs> which a phrase i really despise but unfortunately that is just the case until unless we knew more about yeah. what your your firm is because that's the 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 problem with risk screening is that there's no one size fits all for every firm every industry every jurisdiction it really is down to what does your business do what products do you provide and who's behind your client if you've got yeah. A client. yeah okay i think you know right. just that, that starting point as long as you get your kind of risk matrix in a really sort of good condition that's really suitable to your company and your mm -hmm. you know yeah. customers and services and what have you it's that you know it's the best starting place you can have but there are always going to be more complicated scenarios aren't there that that might yeah. fall outside of that um that matrix mm -hmm. okay the the next question oh and just kind of going back to that you know if you are somebody who's trying to put together your risk assessment program and you're new or you're new to your industry um you know again Bill, I mean, this is where, you know, reaching out to a consultant, usually most jurisdictions have, you know, very good consultants, compliance consultants, getting just some feedback on what you've written. Um, I think that's, that is a very good um, investment. <laughs> I mean, because yeah, you're going to have to pay them, but it's a very good investment, especially if it's going to stop you from getting an audit or a repeat audit or, and of course, with the, the regulators having so much pressure on them. Uh, to prove that they are, you know, penalizing and fining and, and auditing. Um, it's good just to have a second pair of eyes, especially if you're in a really small firm who does not have, um, you know, a, a huge department and, and multiple sets of eyes on compliance. It's, that's, I think that's a mm. good investment to, to do. Definitely, um, definitely. Yeah. Uh, another question has come in. Uh, they ask, do you suggest transparent overviews for high risk clients? I may have heard wrong, but we request for all new clients and transparent overviews to me. That's just down to the due diligence. You know, you're, you're getting more than just the KYC, such as, you know, knowing somebody's name, address and nationality. 
Um, but there, but you're also again looking at you know what products you're you're providing to them. Um, that's part of the due diligence, and of course your your sanctions check, and and you might have to do so. You might be doing some adverse media checks depending on the the screening solution that you're using, mm-hmm. or you you may even just be doing like a quick Google review um, if you're still relying on that, which I think has its pros and cons. Um, but uh, I don't. Did you have any responses? I mean, to me, it, it's that that when when you say um, you said you, they use the word transparent overviews. Mm-hmm. That digging down into the clients. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean that depends. They're going. Yeah, I mean, it depends on on what your firm does, really, mm-hmm. um, doesn't it? I mean, um, when I've worked for in corporate services um, and trust businesses, you you would do that every single time because of the nature of the business. That's right. Yeah, uh, that's right. much much higher risk than you know. Right. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, you would do, you you basically everyone's getting. Uh, EDD in effect um, yeah but yeah so so it really depends on um, on what you're offering and what what your customer base is yeah yeah and of course like if you're a small bank just providing a you know checking account to mm. you know, if you're credit you, you wouldn't want to do that so again that that's yeah. very much yeah. dependent on the service that you're providing okay mm. um, Tom can you tell if I have any other questions oh wait here's one do you think manual underwriting and AML risk rate risk screening are more riskier than automated screening. Manu- so manual mm. underwriting and AML risk mm. screening are more riskier than automated screening. Oh, I think I there's think- pros and cons to both. What, what's your thoughts? Uh, yeah, uh, my thoughts are you've got to, again, depending on the business, you should have um, a mixture of both, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, if you're a big business with many transactions, you know, you, you've just got to have automated um, systems like that, you know, uh, yeah. and maybe verification systems and certainly screening tools in, in pretty much all cases. Um, yeah. But then, you, you know, you'll want to, and that, that will give you kind of daily um, alerts, your real-time alerts of, of things that might be going on after you've pro- programmed in your, um, you know, rules and thresholds and what have you. Um, but then you'll want to do kind of retrospective checks uh, as well, which uh, are more likely to be manual. Um, so typically the best solution, again, as I say, depending on the size of the firm, is a mixture of the two. Right, right. And the one thing I would add to, you know, again, working with technology as I get more and more into technology, is um, you really need to understand if you, when you do have the automated screening tools, or any technology understand your settings mm. um, and because if you are getting too many uh, hits or results yeah. For, yeah. with screening your your settings might be um, too low if you're mm-hmm. not getting enough they're too high um, you and you know understand which databases are being screened what what information mm-hmm. is going into those databases and why mm-hmm. um, and how, how those those screening providers work uh, mm-hmm. Again, as technology kind of improves uh, and gets better and better, uh, those things are changing. So you you might have to check your settings you know, a couple times yeah. a year. Um, oh, definitely, definitely. And, and yeah. yeah, any decent provider is going to help you with that as well because that's you know that should be part of the service. Yeah, um, you yeah. know, helping you with your settings based on your firm's requirements. It's always about your firm's requirements. Um, yeah. and your customer base and your services um, yeah. but also I mean, just, just, sorry go sorry, ahead one example that we had sorry we're talking over each other one example we had was uh here was we had somebody uh their screening thresholds were set too low i think it was like at 72 and the result was given the, the number that they had was they had it was like 90,000 hits. Well, small compliance team, I mean, that would have taken them a year just to go through those hits that, you know, happened. So we were able to help them remove those, remove anything from that, that had that 72 up to, we then uh, changed their setting to 90 and and reduced like all those false positives from, from 90,000 from 90, yeah. views. Yeah. Um, so, so that's something that you're, you're, 
provider should be kind of, as you say, should be able to help you with so you don't have to yeah. clear all those hits. Um, but still, again, tweak your, your your settings so that you don't keep getting these, you know, mm -hmm. stupid amount of hits that clearly are not hits. So you know, they're false positives. With, with yeah, yeah. And, that, and you're not missing anything um, important yeah. as well. So it's just getting yeah. that fine balance, isn't it? Yeah. But at the same time, and of course, I made the comment, you know, I think a Google review has its pros and cons. Um, is especially as events take place, you know, you you know, you might do a Google Google review and find out one of your corporate clients is in liquidation that, but it hasn't hit the screening database provider yet. Um, that information. So, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So that's why uh, that combination of of both is 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 good. Good. Mm -hmm. good. Good question though. All right. Let me see if I've got anything else. Um, I've got one. Israel has started their own freedom convoy. Oh, okay. So they're, <laughs> this is those, those, um, the convoy drove from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem on Monday and converged on parliament. Wow. Yeah. These, these convoys are, are popping up all over. I didn't realize Israel was as well. Oh, um, those are those trucker convoys. So, um, it's, it's very, very interesting of seeing what's, what's going to happen with, with all that politics. Mm -hmm. Okay. Tom, have I missed any? Again, it's really hard for me to see these questions. Uh, one that has popped up twice is, given the pandemic, would you consider video conferencing or a video Teams meeting, et cetera, as face-to-face -face business? I would. Um, and again, I, th I think that's just going to be one of those things. But I mean, we, we can't get together you know, at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I, I personally would. Uh, what about you? Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I think I'm I'm going to go my stock phrase again. It always depends <laughs> on them, on you know the person you're you're meeting. So you know, is if there's anything sort of high risk about that customer, um, you know, are they kind of contacting you from you know where you where you'd expect them to be contacting you from? I think in most mm -hmm. cases, I'd, I'd agree with you, Kimberly you know it's face to face you're meeting them um as long as you've id'd them you've verified them properly you've um, yeah. you know, you've gathered evidence uh that their business is what they say it is they're who they say yeah. they are you know uh you're absolutely sure that the documents you have are real um genuine documents then you know there's not much more that can be done is there um, right, right. So yeah, generally speaking, yes, but there could always be slight situations where you just want to be a bit more careful. And I don't, uh, I think in those cases, because you, you know, you still wouldn't be able to go and meet them necessarily. It might just be a case of gathering further documentary evidence to support who they are. Yeah. Okay. I am seeing another question that's, that's coming up, kind of going back to the PEPs and, uh, uh, and I think the underlying question is um the question is what if the pep is regulated so you the fsa do you still have uh fsa regulated individuals fca yeah fca yeah so that that dates me right there um <laughs> fca still, it's still the uh, same beast <laughs> yeah exactly so they're saying what if the pep is regulated or the ceo of a listed company so obviously listed companies are are highly you know you know, watched and regulated so if you have somebody who's a PEP and the PEP is regulated, you know, maybe with the by the FCA, um, and or or their director or CEO of a listed entity, would their high risk status? Well, gosh, uh, thinking about this too, like in in Cayman, for instance, if they're listed, you can do what's called simplified due diligence, or at least you could a few mm, years that's ago. That's right. The same here, yeah. So could you still apply that simplified due diligence method? To a client, a corporate client, if the pet is regulated. So that I mean, there's two different things going on there, isn't there? Because yeah. you know, a pet is going to be typically a person, um, and the enlisted company, a regulated firm, is going to be yeah. you know, the firm itself. So yes, so you're going to be again, you're going to be looking at where is that firm regulated, where is that human pet regulated mm -hmm. um but also you know what type of pep are they what type of business are they doing what what services do they want from you um mm -hmm. and you know you've got to think about why a pep is a pep well they're higher right. risk as a pep 
because you know there are they're at higher risk of perhaps corruption or, or something like that or you know mm -hmm. getting things done uh, uh, not going through the correct channels and, and what have you that's why a pep is considered a pep so you have to think about in terms of the business that you're offering does that pep status forgetting the regulatory status does the pep status um, pose some kind of risk in relation to what your uh, what your business will be with them right okay I'm just trying to think of it. I wonder too if like just like okay so you have that individual who's a CEO um, so they're not necessarily your client but maybe you could mm. just monitor that individual more frequently mm. and yeah. but keep the company itself as low or medium or maybe even, you know maybe bump it up to medium risk even though you still apply the you know simplified due diligence method because it's mm -hmm. listed maybe uh, I that's think probably something yeah. I yeah. I mean if there was nothing else about you know extracting the fact that this example CEO is a pep and there's mm -hmm. nothing else that's kind of you know particularly high risk then yeah you know you could do something like that and just as we've said many times uh, throughout mm -hmm. this webinar just make sure you're documenting it and your you know the yeah. reasons for decisions yeah I think that's a good idea okay hope that answers that question um, let me see if I'm missing anything else uh, Tom is there any question that you see I've missed uh, I'll jump in with uh, one more if we've got time a uh, regulated nominees how far should you go to identify the UBO if the local laws of the country of the nominee do not allow for the sharing of UBO information? Oh, that is a tough one. Hang on, let, let me try and understand this. Are we talking about if you've got a nominee shareholder in a corporate structure? Is this is this what we're talking about? So, can you repeat the question, Tom? Mm. Yep. Regulated nominees, how far should you go to identify the unofficial of uh, the UBO if the local laws of the country of the nominee do not allow for the sharing of UBO information? Yeah, I mean, the local laws, um, as in if it's outside of your own jurisdiction and neither here yeah. nor there in that case, it's your jurisdiction that matters. And you know, here in the UK, you have to know who ultimately owns, um, uh, you know, the customer, the corporate customer, and that's the end of the story. So you need to go through every single layer, however intricate that is, and, that, and you'd have to start asking some questions if it's if it's super intricate. And if you've got nominees in place, you know, why are they there? Would be a, a question. I know that's kind of outside what you're asking, but you know, you'd need to start asking yourself why why that. You know why it's opaque like that. Uh, what the purpose, yeah. is, what the rationale is. You know. <laughs> I, I so, think um, I've even had this this situation, and I again, it depends on that the the country where that that nominee is being regulated, mm. how where they fit in your risk appetite. Mm. Um, again, I'd be. I, I think there's ways around it to where you can say, okay, well. They're highly. It's still a highly regulated country. We're we're you know we're comfortable doing business with this particular regulated you know nominee. Um, you know we've done our due diligence on them. Nothing's coming up. Um, I think there's ways around but, it. But again, well, it goes back to what what are you comfortable with? Yeah, but they're and, by their nature they're acting on behalf of the actual economic ultimate beneficial owner right in that scenario yeah, yeah. and i guess so you're right you have, to, you have yeah. to know who that person is or or you know people are you have to and that's there's you know well certainly here and in europe you have to and there's nothing right. no way around that at all so you because you've got to make it's, it's the money flow. You can't it, take the business, really. No, absolutely, you can't take the business. If you cannot get into the the real end person or people, you can't take the business on. Okay. I, I think we've had a few more comments on that. I, I, I think it's associated to that. They further commented, say the client is, say, a Swiss bank acting as nominee. Mm. They also commented they provide a comfort letter. Yeah, no. Sorry, that those days are pretty much over 
here. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they yeah, they I guess you're right with the, the beneficial ownership yeah. regulations. And there, so there aren't any scenarios where you cannot know who your customer is, and that's it. Yeah. And you know that if you're using, because there there are different terms and what have you. If you you know the term nominee means they're acting on behalf of someone else. And you have mm -hmm. to know who that someone else is. Now, many moons ago, I, you know, certainly in the business I, I worked in, um, you know, and I'm going back 20 years, um, those questions weren't asked, <laughs> and they weren't, you know, and, and that was pretty normal for that for that environment. And yeah, and mm -hmm. uh, you could have numbered accounts at the bank and things like that, no names on them and everything. But that's just simply not able to be done now. So yeah, I can't emphasize that strongly enough. Yeah, kind of like the days of bearer shares are gone now. Yeah, yeah, quite, yeah. Whereas 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we could still do those. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any other last questions? And that, cause we're running half an hour, we're going up beyond half an hour. I mean, an hour and a half now, so. Uh, it's an exciting I, topic. <laughs> yeah, it is, it really is exciting. Okay, Tom, two yeah, more uh, polling questions. I was going to say, I, I believe that's all of the questions answered and uh, commenting that we've gone over half an hour. It's um, yeah, yeah. great to see so many people still in attendance. Yeah, no, exactly. So yeah. we've captured their their uh, attention. So let's just have have the, the last two polling questions, uh, if you don't mind, Tom. Uh, again, we're just wanting to know if uh, you feel more confident about your risk assessment procedures or if you realize you need to make some changes, if you don't mind, uh, kind of help us know if, if Gage, if, if we're kind of helping with these discussions and, and ways that we can approve them. Um, so yeah, so yeah, this is good. Um, I'm, if you want to go ahead and close that one, Tom, at least half of you are feeling that you are feeling a bit more confident uh, and 45% are saying um, you think you need to consider more factors. So uh, I'm glad we could help you at least realize that either feel more confident or I realize you need to make some improvements. And um, also in this next one is just to kind of help us uh, gauge a little bit about where, if I need to be focusing on some other discussions. So if you like to dive deeper um, about maybe screening or drafting policies and procedures, beneficial ownership kind of, again, that kind of came up. Uh, and another one, any new industries and technologies, because we're always uh, keeping an eye on new industries and technologies as they do mature. Uh, fantastic. So it's really kind of a fairly even split there. So, okay, excellent. So if you just want to show that one, I'm just kind of showing basically 60% about drafting policies and procedures. That's good to know because that's going to be one of our next ones coming up in March. Uh, peeps, more people want to know about beneficial ownership as well as screening and, and new industries and technologies. Fantastic. Thank you for, for answering those. For anybody who is interested in um, Corinna's services, she is a consultant and these are some of the services she, provi she provides. You can go to conventium, um, amlcompliance.com. Sorry, it's just conventium.com and I will be putting in an email follow-up her email address if you want to reach out to her as well. And that is it for today's broadcast. And again, to our audience, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, we do know your time is valuable, um, so we appreciate it. And I apologize, we, we keep going over. I should start telling people it's going to be an hour and a half. Uh, but we do hope you found today's broadcast helpful and that you can take the information presented today and strengthen your AML and counterterrorism compliance policies. Uh, we also want you to be confident in your customer onboarding, risk assessment, and monitoring procedures. So we do hope today helped you. Uh, our next scheduled webinar, I do have Angela Mealy of RISPASC in the Cayman Islands. She's going to be joining me to discuss disaster recovery policies and procedures. And as we all know, the past two years have taught us how important uh, these policies and procedures are. And of course, there's only continued nat natural disasters and technological threats. So, you know, we really need to have these kind of pinned down, maybe do a, a review of how you dealt with the pandemic. Um, and, and again, strengthen those uh, disaster recovery um, situations in place that you do have in place. Uh, again, I'll be including this uh, a link to this particular register, uh, register, register webinar, sorry, in our follow-up email, and that usually goes out on Friday, so please keep an eye out for that. And again, um, oh, there might be another one before this, uh, so I'm working with the guests on speaker and times, um, so you can keep an eye out. We, we will send you out a, an email invite to that. 
Thank you again to Corinna. Thank you so much for joining us. I thought the, the conversation was very, very um, informative.